I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? We left. We were trying to take back over. We're doing an autism. Dr. Patricia Jabe Wesley is a survivor of Liberia's civil war. A gifted poet, scholar, public speaker, and human rights activist, her powerful poems are a tribute to the dead and an appeal to the living. An associate professor of English and creative writing at Penn State, she's the author of four widely acclaimed volumes of poetry. Regarded by many as the voice of Liberia, she's the recipient of numerous awards and grants and has traveled extensively in the U.S. and abroad, giving readings to enthusiastic audiences. We'll talk with her about her new memoir, about how education saved her, and about going home. Here's our conversation with Patricia Jabe Wesley. Patricia Jabe Wesley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Patty. It's always a pleasure. After four critically acclaimed books of poetry, you, you recently finished what you've described as your life's project, your memoir about your experiences of suffering and loss and death, uh, surviving the Liberian Civil War. Tell us a little bit about what compelled you to write it. Um, I'm a writer, okay. But um, the Liberian Civil War has not yet been captured by anyone, and, and poetry cannot do it well. <clears throat> I know I've written poetry about the war and the experiences, and others have written, but uh, no Liberian has been able to write about the war from the perspective of the victims, and including themselves. And so I always wanted to tell our story. <clears throat> our story as survivors and to talk about those who did not survive. And when you read, you read most of the memoir and you saw me, you know, memorializing people right? just by telling their stories, even before they die, you know, um, the little I knew of them. And so I feel that that memoir will not just talk about my survival, but it is a story of, of people intertwined with one another because war is like that. When you are at a war and you're fighting and you're running and, and you are fighting to survive and you're struggling, you're doing it together. You're not doing it as a family unit. Everybody is family or everybody could be enemy. So I wanted to tell our story and, and, and I'm glad I, I, I did. I'm hoping. Well, what, what, what was it like? Because in order to write it, you had to relive it. And I have to say, some of it is unbelievably ghastly. Well, one of the fortunate things about me being a writer is I'm always intrigued by things happening around me. I don't let them go unrecorded. I take notice of everything around me, even people around me. So one of the things that happened to me in the war was that I knew I would have to tell this story. I knew that if I lived true, in fact, at one point in the memoir, if you came across that, I said, if, I, if we survive, this would be a story to tell. Because the war, the Liberian Civil War, was unbelievable. And they, 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 For they, so many reasons. Yeah, so on, many on things. so many levels. So many levels. Unbelievable. And it was like you were living a a horror drama. You were moving, following a camera, you know, or the camera lens following you. And so, and I, I felt that I needed to start recording little things. I, I wrote poems here and there because you can, I always tell people, you can write poems on the run. But you can't write. You can't so write prose on the run. So I wrote a lot of poems. I remember people you know, cussing me up because I was writing when people were dusty with, uh, you know, concrete after a bombing near our camp. And so when we got to the U.S., we had friends in Grand Rapids that we lived with, and, and, and then later on, as we moved out on our own, many were encouraging me to write because I would tell these stories and people would cry. And they say, you can tell stories, right? And I didn't have money to buy anything. A friend bought me my first computer, one of those old computers in 
two. When, okay. when you were in the United when States, we're, yeah, you, when you fled in 1991. Yeah, when we're in Grand Rapids Michigan. area, Michigan, a friend bought it. That was when the computer had my kids used to have fun, and um, where the the paper was a roll, was on a roll, <laughs> and I would type all day or all week, and my kids would stretch the roll of paper all around the house in order to separate them according to pages. I took off 92 the entire year. I didn't look for work and, and, and part of 91 and wrote everything as I remembered it. Mm -hmm. And for some reason I knew I would forget. And so I just sat down and wrote, and I wrote 500 pages, a computer 500 pages, and then put them away. And, and 10 years, 15 years later, and I kept pushing myself trying to write a memoir. I was studying, I would stop because I had small children. And it's, but when I decided to finally organize the material the way I wanted to go, and I set the outline, and I knew how the story would go, you know, I went to that 500 page book that was just my angry recordings of dates and people's names, little details by in 15 years, I have forgotten all the little details. I have forgotten people's names. So I would go in there, it was like a dictionary. It was dictionary. like a diary. It was like a, di yeah, it was like my encyclopedia. I would go in there and I would see something. I'm like, I'm like is it real? Did General Nimlin take over when Doe was mm -hmm. killed? And then I would go into Google and I would, I would I will Google. Look up Samuel Doe. Yeah, yeah, I'll Google who took over the night, do, the day after Doe was killed. And the name will pop on me. I'm like, yes, I'm right. And so I realized that that was a good thing to have friends who kept saying, right. Even though that was not the memoir, I thought it was, but it was just a bunch of uh, material I would need. In that. You once said, my heart has a hole where all the stories no one has heard linger forever. And so I, I think it's in a poem. Okay, and, and I can't yeah. remember the poem. <laughs> but at, at some level, it must have been enormously cathartic to finally have it all on paper. Yeah, it, it was a very difficult book to write. Very, very difficult. Even in the first stage when I was doing the recording, I would break down and cry for hours. I would work for three hours and just weep. You know, and then when I started writing the book as a memoir in the way it is now, I found out it was still difficult to write it. And what was interesting was that two years ago I was invited to read at Frostburg University to do a workshop and um, on and the memoir. And the, the the part of the contract was that I read from my memoir. And if you read that passage where we are returning home on November 1, 1990, November 1. Okay, after leaving Seoul, Michigan, yeah, refugee Seoul Clinic, camp. Yeah, yeah. And a woman in front of me in line, she was the last in line with her family, and a very small woman. And, and we weren't on the main highway because there had been an ambush and come back of child sitters soldiers on our day. And so they told us to walk away from the street in between the houses and very poor people's houses. And it was bullshit because nobody had done anything with it. These, these were ghost towns. So, and the woman dropped and, and I didn't know that she it was collapsed. a street. It was, it was a stray bullet. They, uh, it was a stray bullet, and, and I was behind her, and I didn't want to, and everybody said, jump over, jump over. And my husband said, let's go, let's go. And, you know, the, the order on the side was, and by the people leading us, the peacekeepers was, uh, keep moving, because there are thousands of people in line coming. And I jumped over her. Her, her children, grown children, came back. And I was reading that part at first work, and I broke down. Oh. And, and I, was, I was surprised, I'm like, I wrote this thing. Why am I crying, you know? And I broke down because it's, 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 very, it's a hard book. It's very hard, you know? Y you have said to your students, your uh, students at Penn State Altoona, I have literally walked over the dead to get to, to, get America. to America. What can stop me now? <laughs> yes, I've said that, and you know what? 
And sometimes you forget what you say. And when I say those things, I usually am trying to encourage them about what they think of me. Not to be discouraged. Yeah. But and when and I'm throwing in a big cancer issue. I remember last year, in April, and just two weeks before my surgery, I finally decided to tell everyone that I had cancer, but I could not tell my students that I had cancer. So I just told them that I was ill and I was going to go through a procedure and it would take months of recovery and I needed to do some treatments and I would be away from work probably for a year. And they, and they, they broke down you know, sobbing. Some kids who had lost family to cancer. One girl had lost her father in one of the classrooms. She wept like she was, her father had just died, holding me. And she's holding me and crying and begging me not to die. And, I'm, oh. and I look healthy, you know, that day. And one other young man who was very quiet, he came up to me and he, and he said, when his turn came to greet me, to say goodbye, he said, I don't know what, what they're crying for. He says, you're going to be great. You're going to be fine. You're going to whip that cancer, and you're going to come marching out here. I said, how do you know? Because I was scared. I was scared. And he said, because I know you. You came here walking on the dead to get here. You survive war. And you I... can do anything. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. It comes back to you. What you say about where you've been to these young people they take it in and use it for themselves, but it comes back to encourage you. And I held on to that. He said, this kid said, I can do it, you know. And I it was actually March 2014 when you got a call from McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh saying that not only do you have cancer, but that you have an aggressive form of uterine cancer. And it sounds like you did. You dealt with this tragedy the way you survived war with the same determination. I'll have to read something you, you write in your memoir. My husband kept reminding me throughout the war that if we decided by faith that we would not die, we would not die. Yes, we believed that we would live for, for some reason. Sometimes it was hard to believe it. <laughs> sometimes it was hard to believe it. And, and I believe that mm, Hundreds of thousands of Liberians made up their minds that they were going to live. And that same principle was the one, and that is the one that cancer patients need to have. That principle that I am here to live. You know, it's, 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 it, the first thing is the attitude. And, I'm not saying when I got the news, I, the first thing I said was, I'm going to live. No. When I got the news. You cried. First, I was silent. I thought the doctor, the OBGYN was crazy, you know. And, and, and then after a pause, and she started talking to me, encouraging me, because I was silent. And she, she had studied me. She knew me because she told me, she, she said, I have found a doctor. Who's that as you were like, you who, are. As tub, who is as stubborn <laughs> as you are? And she only, well, she knew I was stubborn because the doctors in Altoona did not diagnose me and they kept doing one mm. procedure after the other. So I came to Pittsburgh and the doctor here was going to do the same procedure I was running away from. And I said, I need to be tested for cancer. If you think I have cancer, she said, well, we have to. So I left and that's when I went to McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh. And they, they said, why are they doing all these, these procedures? And one little procedure in the office, the same day they saw me for the first time, and a few days later they told me, this is America. You know, you can find out things, and this is the 21st century, you know. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, yeah, it, it was shocking, and I was scared. And, and for a while I was silent. I was silent. I refused to put Which it on Which is Facebook. unlike you. Yeah. I was silent. I didn't want to tell anybody. And that's one of the hardest things I discover, that um, when you hide such news, you, you alone are be bearing your heavy, heavy load. And the moment I began to tell friends, I discovered how many women around me 
had experienced cancer. But in a way that is, uh, that parallels your experience with surviving war. There are some who cannot tell the stories that you've told and some of them are absolutely horrific, standing mm -hmm. at checkpoints and watching people being uh, pulled out of the line to mm -hmm. be murdered or raped or these are all things that, that you've seen. You say in a way that, that telling the story on one hand makes the world cry but also unburdens you yeah. of the story and the responsibility of the life that you watched being snuffed out. Y yes, and when, we've, when, when I first arrived in this country in 1991 with my family, I could not talk about the Liberian Civil War, even though it was still going, you know, ongoing, and, it didn't end and more horrific things happened than I saw. More horrific things happened than I saw. So there will be Liberians who may be watching this, and they will say, oh, she was lucky. <laughs> Imagine what I wrote. She was lucky. So even though I, I capture what I capture because of what I saw, there are others who suffer far more than me, you know. And, and I felt like I needed to, to tell at least the, the, what I think is a little of the story and for everyone. You actually could have left earlier because your firstborn child, your daughter, mm -hmm. Bess, was born in the United States when you were going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Embassy in Liberia said, all those who were born in the United States, it's time to leave. And you were asked to, one parent could have mm -hmm. left with her. Mm -hmm. And you and your family said, no, if, if we die, we die as a family. Yes, and many, many, many people separated their families and as a result, um, destroy their, 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 their marriages. But that's not the only thing. And some of the children that were left behind by, most time it was the mother that took the American child. And those mothers left behind babies. Some of their babies, my baby, I had You had a baby, baby on your back. I had Gee, a baby. You were carrying Gee, him, Gee yes. Was, she was two months old when the war broke out in Liberia. And, and by the time I would have left him there, he probably would have only been six or seven months. And you wouldn't know him. No, 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 he wouldn't have survived. You see, one of the things that um, I knew and my husband I knew was that together we were stronger and together we could care for the children more, but also um, not just for the children. And, I had a burden for the people around me, and including my family, my parents. My mother would have died. She would have died in the first few weeks of the war, you know. And so I didn't see myself breaking up a family to leave my other uh, and two children, you know, in Liberia with my husband, you know. And most men his age at that time were targeted. For, he was in his 30s. Yeah, he, they, would, they were targeted as rebels or militants, you know. And it was hard to know who was the enemy. It was, and who, it, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, we could not do that. Um, and for some reason, my husband and I um, were always close, you know, especially in those first 25 years, you know, raising the kids. And it was like we function one brain. So it was not easy to separate the brain and leave one person, you know. And I felt that Liberia had invested enough in me, and this was a time for me to experience the war as much as I could then and contribute. And we did contribute, if you read towards the end, after the people came home from the, the uh, camps for the first ceasefire, we initiated a, a school. A, a, not just a oh. school, we brought the first food to our area. We started a clinic in which women were, uh, and we went and just took over an old clinic that was demolished, you know. And we, I, my life was saved there, right, in, uh, by the nurses that volunteered their services and doctors because nobody was employed. And we had this community grassroots movement 
that we spearheaded. I forgot it for a while, mm. but I was in South Carolina for a very important bish Liberian bishop's funeral. And after I spoke, I was coming down and a young woman ran to me and she hugged me crying. And she said, Mrs. Wesley, Professor Wesley, do you remember me? I said, no, I don't. And she said, I was your, one of your volunteers. Mm -hmm. Don't ever forget, I'm following your writing, don't ever forget the efforts of Congo Town, where, where you and your husband help bring refugees back home to their homes, the contributions. And she reminded me, at that time I had left it out of the memoir, and that's when I went back and began to correct it. You have said more than once that education literally and figuratively saved your life. There were so many times going through these horrendous checkpoints where people were drugged and, and dressed in women's gowns and <laughs> guns and, and grenades on their belts and just insanity. Um, but often you would pass a student, a former student, who would say they're good people, let them pass. Yes, and, and it, it, you know, there are no guarantees in such a wild, rebel-driven violence. There's no guarantee. There are no guarantees whether your student, your former student, or your former maid will save your life. So some of it I also attribute to faith, to God because I saw students who were well-meaning. At the time, the very time, our lives were threatened when we were about to be taken out of line for execution. Some student that we Rescue. had not, yes, if you read a it's memoir. There are miraculous yeah. things throughout, literally yeah. miraculous yeah. things throughout your story. There was a time that um, a friend of mine and, and, and no, I went to get food because a student of mine, his name was Harrison Gay, and he was a big commando. He saw me in the camp suffering and starving, and he said, come, come. And I went, and he was in this big marsh, and there was a security gate, a security office. And I didn't know all of, all, all of that. And so they caught me, and they wanted to know why I was walking around the commando's mansion, his Luther Mansion, okay, somebody's house. Oh, it was yeah, someone's house, yeah. yes. And, and they were talking about how they would execute me, and they were arguing about it, and, and a, a young man in a, somewhere in the back room said, I want to see the woman you're going to be taking for execution. I am crying, I'm in tears, okay? I can't scream, but I'm in tears, and I'm scared. My brother, I told him not to come along. He was hiding and like, you know, maybe 200, you know, uh, um, yards away from the house in a bush um, because he only went to take me through the long walk. And Back because, to the rest of your family. Yeah, because my, I didn't want them to kill him, you know. They were killing young or recruiting young boys like him. He was like maybe 16 or 15. And so um, I, I, I was there and the guy said, I want to see the woman. She said she's a professor. Let me see. I went to the University of Liberia. And he comes out. And it happens to be my former student. But the interesting thing is that um, he and I had had interactions just a couple months or three months before the breakout of the war in our city, you know, because he came and for water problems we we're having with our neighbor, and he was sent with a team to supervise a reconnection. And so he reunited with me because he had been, he had been out of college for years. years. Okay. So he would have forgotten me, but he, he reconnected mm, with me three miracle, months before. Actually. And he comes out and he says, oh my God, so this is, this is my professor you're trying to kill. Oh my God, and they started an argument. He said, kill me. Kill me and let her go. Just shoot me. And he was one of them. And, well, they couldn't shoot him. You know, if you look at the history of Liberia, which incidentally was, was founded by freed American slaves in 1822, it has been governed by one bad president after another. 
Uh, Tubman, I think, sounds like someone that you like. We, Tubman, no, no, I didn't like, like Tubman. Okay, okay Tubman to Tolbert. Uh, <laughs> to Samuel Doe, to Charles Taylor, who was uh, convicted of war crimes. We now, you now have uh, the first woman president in an African country, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. How optimistic are you for the future of Liberia? I am optimistic. I am optimistic that once Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's term is over, those that somehow new people will rise up. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is a woman, but Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, what the story we never heard, she is from the old order. She is, or she was, the finance minister of the Tobo administration, and she's always been. So one of the things I see is that she may be having difficulty moving forward, and because you know, and maybe the new, new and younger people will. Re I don't believe that there's a country without hope. Mm. There is hope. Patricia Jabe Wesley, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much, Patty Citalia. It's always a pleasure to be interviewed by you. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be here at WPSU. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Patricia Jabe Wesley. For additional footage from this interview, visit our website at conversations.psu.edu. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you.